Hey, this is Evan Longoria of your San Francisco Giants, and you're listening to TortureCast. You're listening to a podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants. Let's go, Giants! With hosts Willie Dills, Chad King, Ben Lee, and Eric Nathanson. Dedicated to the greatest team in Major League Baseball, the San Francisco Giants. This is Torture Cast. It's Thursday, April 26, 2018, and this is episode 140 of the Torture Cast, the podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants. I'm your host, Chad King, and joining me again from Georgia is Eric Nathanson. What's up, dude? Uh, not much. I, I hate these days off. It's a long, boring day. We need baseball again. <laughs> it's, uh, what, been 10 days since we recorded? I was traveling this week, so we have kind of bumped this to a unusual Thursday broadcast or recording, but we did want to get one out for you before the Dodgers come in and before the Giants play too much. Uh, but it's been uh, an okay week. You know, I like I like Eric's new torture level rating of 1 to 10. And, uh, you know, I don't want to spoil anything because it's been a few extra days since he's, he's written his last torture report, but I'd say since we last recorded the tortures at about a, I'd say about a 5 or so, yeah, you know, that's, about that's right fair. in the middle because they were yeah. five and four. They played nine games since we recorded on Monday. Five and four. They did lose yesterday. It could have made it a nice six and three, but they got they got blown the f up by the Nats yesterday. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But overall, the Giants are eleven and thirteen again, floating around five hundred. It looked like it was going to get kind of bad there. They were six and ten and seven and eleven, but they've they've gained a couple games since then. They are in fourth place and five and a half back of Arizona. So technically not, technically now six back because Arizona won this afternoon. Oh thank you. Okay. So Arizona <laughs> I know, another I, I actually, half game there. Yeah, right. So it literally just happened like an hour ago tops. You know? Yeah, so they haven't been able to really gain any ground against Arizona because they're they're doing well. And and part of the week, of course, the reason why they're falling further behind Arizona is they did lose two of three at Arizona. They were outscored seven to five. They did win their very first series of the year. Can you believe it took that long to win their first series of the year? Um and they cool. did it against the the uh what's his face? Los <laughs> Angeles <laughs> Angels of Anaheim Disney Corporation or whatever the hell their name is now. <laughs> Otani. I almost said Ohani. Uh, why would I yeah. say Ohani? Uh yeah, the Otani they... led uh Angels. They did win two out of three and then they beat Washington two out of three despite losing in a laugher yesterday. So so overall not a bad week, but um, it'd be nice if if they could you know push put together a, a good six and two kind of seven and one week one of these times. But alas, we'll take what we can get. Yeah, you mentioned series victories. It was hard for them because a lot of the series to open the season it was four in L.A. and mm. then it was two against Seattle. And then it turned into two against L.A., so they didn't even play a three-game series until, like, the fourth series of the season. Yeah, that's a and really then, good point. Yeah, they, the, the, the one that gets me still is um, before that Arizona series last week, they lost three or four to San Diego, and that's what's put them behind the eight ball. If it was wasn't for say... that series, they'd, they'd be 500. They'd look pretty good. You know, two out of three, like, I'm fine with two out of three from the Nats, and I'm <clears> fine <throat> getting blown away 15 to two because they already took care of business in those first two games. Yeah, it doesn't matter too much. What's funny is they were outscored 20 to 10 by the Nationals in the series because of the one lopsided score, yet they won two out of three. They outscored um, the Angels 15 to 7, so, you know, they kind of got some back there. That's why baseball's a weird thing. I know that a lot of the standings this year are now incorporating a runs a run differential column, and it's in the beginning part of the year, the first month, it's kind of fun to look through there because, yeah, most of the first place teams have a dominant net positive, and most of the last place teams have a dominant net negative. But some of the people, some of the teams floating around 500, like the Giants, it varies a lot. Uh, and you can see that they just have a lot of variability in their scores. So uh, a 500 team doesn't necessarily, you know, is not floating around zero in terms of run differential. And, and look at right here, the Giants take two out of three, but they get outscored by 10 runs in the series. So yeah. It's not exactly the most accurate stat in the world. You do have to play 
probably a good half a season before that starts to normalize, I would say. And they've given up 19 more runs than they've scored this season, yet they still managed to almost be 500. So I'll take it. I mean, there's, there's two games we can point at. They got beat by San Diego 10-1, to and they got beat uh, yesterday by Washington 15-2. to Other than that, everything's been pretty close and pretty tight. There's nothing to skew the run differentials or anything. Yeah, that's a good point. You take those two losses, they're 500, and yep. their run differential is pretty much zero. Out of those yeah, it's pretty even at that point. 11 and 11, yeah. Now, the yeah. San Diego series, you point to that. It That was really, really frustrating. Um, you look at where the, the Padres are right now. They're at the bottom of the barrel. They are 9 and 17. <clears throat> They've lost uh, 7 out of their last 10, and they have, uh, let's see, what, the second worst record in the National League. No, sorry, third worst record in the National League. So... To, for them to win three out of four against the Giants after the Giants won the very first game, you know, it, it does hurt. It does hurt. The Giants just split that series, like you said. They would be 12-12 and 12 right now and ahead of the Dodgers. But it is what it is. These these things happen. And the Giants have won a few tight games again this year already. Um, so it balances out in the end, but it's a rough one. All right, well, let, let me ask you this. We, we talked before the season started, and it's been mentioned a few times, if the Giants stay around 500, then maybe they can make some noise. Did you expect them to actually stay around 500 like this, or are they starting to win games that you did not expect them to win? Um, I think with the changes they made this year, again, going in not knowing some of these slumps that we've been seeing, uh, yeah, I, I, I would have I ballparked right around 500 or maybe a couple games under. I didn't see them tanking like they did in 2017, at least not right away, because of those additions. But, um, yeah, it's. I wish they were doing better, but this is kind of where I thought they would be, yeah, to be honest. Yeah, which is, what about you? Which isn't, yeah, well, I mean, this is actually worse than I thought they would be, but, you know, all my great predictions were well, that's before true. I... Yeah, I forgot here. But, <laughs> but let's be honest. Your total was pretty damn high, yeah. That's 96, <laughs> but... Um, you know, I mean, that was not knowing. They're they're playing. I, I'm frustrated because it, it, it took them so long to get going, um, and they're finally. I, I wrote about it recently. They're finally getting out of their own way by having things like Mac come up to play, by giving other guys shots at the starting rotation, by letting Maranta take high leverage innings. You know, things like that. The Giants kind of saw what they have, and now they're getting out of their own way. So they're they're kind of what I expected, like. I'd like to see more eight to two victories. You know, there was a game against the Angels. It was like eight to one Friday night, and like we barely ever get those laughers as Giants fans. You know, it's always five to three, four to two, four three. You know, that's where the torture gets ratcheted up. You know, we we haven't seen as many of those eight to one games as I'd like to see because I do think this offense can click. But otherwise, I think they're in a perfect position right now. Arizona is, they're not running away with it, but they have not lost a series yet this year. So when you talk about things regressing to the mean, that's going to happen too. And that'll be the chance for the Giants to get back in it. I mean, five and a half games, it, it sounds like a lot when you're three and a half weeks into the season. Three weeks? 11 and 13. Three and a half weeks into the first season, but it's really not that much. It, it's, no, I mean, it's. it's it's one series here, and then you win two out of three, they lose two out of three, and suddenly you're right back in it. Yeah, certainly not insurmountable. <clears throat> Again, they need to cool off, and the Giants need to start playing some better ball. Um, floating around 500 for the first couple months until Bum comes back is, is the goal right now. And I think people also have to understand that when Madison Bumgarner does come back, assuming he's the same pitcher that he's always been, which, look, he had a, a much more serious injury last year. Uh, and everybody was worried when he came back off the DL late in the season. He was fine. He had a couple of rusty starts. But other than that, I mean, his his overall numbers were, were just like normal Mad Bum. And this spring, he was dealing. He was looking very dominant. And that adds to the frustration, I think, because there were a lot of people sensing that he was poised for a very big year. Maybe not a Cy Young year, but maybe one of his best years, just the way he was throwing. Uh, and I think... I saw it during media day. He was really determined to get back on the horse, <laughs> so to speak. Because um, he was very remorseful for his decision of getting on that bike last year. And he said he was embarrassed. He said he knows that he let the team down. He let the fans down. He let his teammates down and, <clears throat> and management down. And so I think 
you know, I don't know what his training regiment was this year, but he's the kind of guy he seems to be able to flip a switch, which has been proven in the in the playoff the playoffs. Uh, like he can be great the regular season and the playoffs he can flip it on or you know very good during the regular season and he flips it on to, you know against Kershaw and the Dodgers on a Saturday afternoon he has that innate ability and i don't know maybe he went in to this season with a little more focus and a little more drive not that he lacked any of that before uh, right and now he's been set back by a stupid you know broken bone from a line drive in his very last start of the spring which is still just it's unbelievable but when he does get back, and assuming he pitches like Mad Bum of old, I mean, we're talking about a guy who gets a war of a, a few to four games a year. He's one of the best pitchers in the National League, but he himself isn't going to add six or seven wins to the Giants. That's not how it works. I think everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, some people misunderstand, hey, look, you pitch every fifth day. Number one, it's certainly not a guaranteed win when he's pitching. And number two, it's not a guaranteed loss if someone else is pitching other than Mad Bum taking his place, i.e. Oh, Chris not. Stratton, right? Uh, not, so, not this year. <laughs> not this year, exactly. So I think people are, are thinking, oh, once he comes back, we're going to get an extra win a week. Well, no, that, no not, not at all. Every third or fourth start, maybe he would get a win where another replacement would not. Maybe. Um, so... <sighs> We have to be careful with uh, overestimating his effect on the team in terms of actual wins and losses. That said, him just being in the dugout and adding a couple of bombs here and there at the plate uh, can definitely turn the tide in, in more than a few games. But I think overall, you're, you're talking about less than two-thirds of the season, almost half the season, that he's going to miss, uh, or you know, about a third of the season he's going to miss. So... He can't really replace too many wins over his replacement. Not not a tremendous amount. So no, I think and the beauty of those expectations. Well, I mean, the beauty of it is is he'll be stepping in a rotation that we originally thought might be in a mess. And right now, Johnny Cueto is leading the National League with a .35 ERA. Chris Stratton's number nine with a 2.32 ERA. Mm -hmm. And these guys are regularly pitching into the sixth and the seventh inning now. It, it's like. Mad Bums, he's needed, but now he's going to be stepping into a rotation that already has a good two-headed monster at the top. I'm salivating over the thought of Bumgarner, Cueto, and Stratton in a three-game series against anybody. I don't yeah. care who it is. It just, it's so appealing. They're, they're so good at the top right now. It sounds weird to say, but they really are. Cueto and Stratton are, are what's helping stem the tide. It's not the fill-in starter of Holland here or Beatty here or even Ty Block. It's been those two guys that have been able to carry it. Yeah, and, and it will lengthen the bullpen because Mad Bum can pitch longer than Derek Holland, and he's a, he's a much higher quality pitcher than Derek Holland. So, and that's, that's where, they, essentially, that's the person he's going to replace, my assumption is. If yeah, mine too. Come back. Uh, if everything stays the same right now, Holland's going to be the one that's going to be um, maybe DFA'd, maybe relegated to the bullpen and having someone else sent back down. I'm not sure. Uh, we can play that game later when, when Mad Bum's back. But uh, yeah, certainly if, if it comes back to Mad Bum, Cueto, Stratton, top three, the way those right. the other two are pitching right now, that's that's very dominant. I mean, Stratton's got a better ERA than, than Clayton Kershaw right now. So, <laughs> I'm not saying he's better than Clayton Kershaw. I'm just, just pointing out that early oddity in the statistics. Well, since um, he's joined the rotation last year, Stratton has never given up more than three runs in a game. Yeah. Smarja gave up three runs in the first inning yesterday. Stratton <laughs> hasn't given up right. Stratton hasn't given up three in a game. Yeah. No, Stratton's been solid. I, I, I like that guy. He's... Uh, yeah. He's doing real well. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I think we should talk about it. You added this to the notes, and, and definitely I wanted to talk about it. But Hunter Pence, he just was not cutting it. And whether it being real or not, he was put on the DL for a thumb injury. And I know he did – was it what, he's diving for a ball, right? And he turned yeah, his like game, or something. Yeah, like opening day or something like that. Yeah, and that's the only problem I have with the quote story is that it took so long for them to go, oh, oh, oh yeah, 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 Hunter hurt his, yeah, that's right, that's right, he hurt his thumb, didn't you, Hunter? Oh, yeah, I did. Okay, yeah, we're going to put you on the DL. Because, look, 
if he really did hurt his thumb and it was lingering and it wasn't healing, and he really wasn't telling the Giants because that's Hunter, who Hunter Pence is. He's not, you know, he's kind of like a Ronnie Lott type. He's not going to tell the Giants, hey, my thumb hurts, I should go on the DL. But he, if that was the case, he was hurting the team because his performance really sucked. And part of it's age, but if the injury is real, I, I could totally imagine the thumb hurting his swing. But man, we've talked about it ad nauseum the last couple of podcasts. You know, like Andrew Baggerly says, it looks like he's hitting while wearing roller skates, you know? Yeah, uh, he does. It, we're watching him arch his back and fling his wrist out to cut, try and cover the outside pitch while he steps in the bucket. He's doing everything that just, you look at, you tell a little leaguer like, dude, you are messed up right now. Um, he's all sorts of discombobulated. And I don't see how that has a huge bearing with the thumb. The thumb's not making him do some of those things, I wouldn't think, but... No. That being said, he was uh, uh, put on the DL, and Mac Williamson, because he was tearing up AAA, just absolutely destroying the Pacific Coast League, uh, he was called up, and his very first game, he launches one, and oh, he's man. been incredible so far, and I think, you know, you have a, a question here about, is this going to last? I mean, who knows? That's the thing. Like... It, it, it starts with the Hunter Pence thing. Like, I'm not sure what the Giants are going to do because Pence doesn't have options. It's not like they can send him to AAA. If they do, they have to DFA him. And they're not going to do that. They're not going to do it. They're just not going to do it. For everybody who, who screams about Hunter Pence needs to get out of the way, it's just not going to happen. Hunter's done too much for the organization, and the organization has done a lot for Hunter. So there's no way. I mean, he is their oldest position player, so I totally get that he might be a bench player. But then, you know, Gorky's hasn't been performing horribly. Blanco has been fantastic. So, like, when Pence comes back, neither Blanco nor Gorky's has options. So do one of those guys get DFA'd? Because, you know, nobody wants to get rid of Mac, or does Mac get sent back down to AAA to, quote-unquote, work on things when he doesn't need to work on a damn thing? Like... Bochy already said when Pence comes back, he's going to play. And I'm not sure I believe him. I'm not sure how much we can believe him. Yeah. I mean, Mac has forced his way into the starting lineup. The guy's homered in three out of five games he's played. And he's, he's got a show homers. Yes. Oh, my God. The one on Tuesday night against Washington after they had taken a, a lead, uh, they extended their lead from one to nothing to three to nothing with Belt's home run. And then. With two outs and I believe two strikes, they get block. Was a block pitch in the other? Yeah, blocked. he gives up. Yeah, he gives up the three-run homer to Michael Taylor the opposite way, and it's like yeah. crap. All that work, you know, for nothing. And then Matt comes out the very next half inning, and it wasn't his hardest. It was his softest home run and his shortest home run of all three. But it made <laughs> such a difference. Like as a Giants fan, I didn't feel like, oh my God, we got to get a guy on, we got to get a guy over, and then get a guy in. Like, mm -hmm. it's the new-look team, and I don't know how you take that out of the lineup. So, Gorky's or Blanco is going to be the odd man out, I think. And I think, I think it has could... to be Gorky's or, or Blanco. I, 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 I hate to say it. I mean, Gorky's and Blanco are hitting almost the exact same right now, 280 and 279. They've been very serviceable. Uh, there's been no problem with them. I mean, Blanco's cooled off a lot. I think he's hitting like 159 over his last 20-something uh, at-bats. Um, so, he has cooled off a bit, but... Still, overall, he's not doing too bad. So I don't know, man. I mean, Hunter Pence is hitting a robust 172 right now on the season, with no home runs and only three RBI. He just and 22 strikeouts and 58 at bats. That's that's one of the most glaring statistics. He's never been a massive strikeout guy, and this year he is. He is he is striking out you know almost 40 percent of the time here. Um, yeah, you're not going to get rid of Pence. You're not going to get rid of the other guys in the outfield. I don't see how it can be anyone but Gorky's or Blanco. Is right. there another? I mean, seriously, is there another scenario? I know there is. Go get rid of Pence. Get rid of Pence. Get you, you, you don't can't. do that. You, you don't just can't. do that. Not not what at fifty eight at bats into the season, and assuming he had a legitimate thumb injury, and for what he's done for this team, and that he's making eighteen million guaranteed, you're not going to do that. That would no. devastate the clubhouse. That would devastate a good portion of the fan base. It would shock a lot of people. Believe me, everyone. That's not going to happen. There's just no, no way. Hunter Pence is on this team for this year. Now, if he gets, quote, injured again, maybe that's something like that might happen. 
uh, he's not going to be DFA'd. It's it's just no. That's what it is now. If he's will, if he's willing to take a bench roll, though, to me yeah. that is huge for Team Morale because he's been a leader for five years. So if the yeah. team set, you know, if people look at it and you know that the new guys are looking at it and they say, oh, if this guy's willing to take a smaller role, something special must be here, and we got to figure out what that is. You know, because no, like I, I Kutch, think that's absolutely what they do right now. They need to. You know, Blanco has more, you know, pull, I think, with Bochi than, than Gorky's. So my guess would be Gorky's would be. I, did you say he has no options left, though? Yeah, they're both out of options. Yeah, That's they're the both problem. out of options. So they have to DFA either one that they release. And they're not going to probably clear waivers. So most likely they're they're going to lose one of those two guys. And that's the risk you run to have 100 pence. And I know that would be a, your bitter Giants fan argument of like, well, if one of these guys is better than 100 pence, why would you get rid of them and not 100 pence? Well, there's a million reasons why. Okay, and we just went over yeah. them. Uh, I, I totally agree with you. I think 100 pence has already said, I'll do whatever it takes to help this team. And so I don't see any issue with him kind of getting a bench roll. And I think that Bochi would be able to talk to him in a way that just makes sense. So he'll be like, you know, Hunter, uh, 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 you know, uh, Mac has, uh, you know, it's a three home runs in five games, and uh, well, you've hit none, and uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, he's, he's won a couple games for us, so uh, we're just gonna ride him right now. So uh, you know what I mean? He's just, I don't think Hunter would be like, no, f you, I'm better than that kid. It's like, well, no, not no. right now. Actually, so, I what I noticed it Tuesday night after Max home run, he was in the dugout. And the person right next to him talking to him was Hunter Pence. Yeah. And that just says so much about Hunter as a person, as a teammate, you know, that he's not looking to be a detriment to the ball club. No, he's, he's nothing but a good teammate and, and a mentor, like you said. So he'd be the first one in Bochy's office going, hey, Skip, no, I would do the same thing. That You'd be an idiot not to do that. Uh, he might even go far as to say, you shouldn't be releasing... <laughs> Gorky or Blanco. <laughs> you yeah, should be right. getting rid of me. No, he probably wouldn't ever go that far. Uh, yeah, I think he should take a bench roll, and he'll have spot starts. That And, and, and Mac's going to hit a wall. He's going to hit a slump. He's going to get into a week where he's going to be one for you know 13, and he's going to go through a power outage. It will happen. And when that happens, that would be a perfect time to give Hunter Pence two or three games in a row and just to see if he has anything left. If he's recovered from the supposed thumb injury, maybe he'll get a shot. And, and, you know, if he strings together a few base hits in two or three games, um, I mean, that causes more problems, obviously. But yeah. at the same time, it, it, it's not going to completely demoralize Hunter for being a, you know, a bench player the entire year. Well, and and that brings us, there. well, that brings me to the other question I posed. Is Mac for real? Or is this just like, because he just adjusted the swing and all that stuff, it's like an overcorrection in a sense. Is he? Mm-hmm. I use the term "flash in the pan," but that's not the right term. Um, is but this like, sustainable? Is, right? Is this the real Mac? You know, I mean, I'm not expecting three home runs in five games all the time. No. <laughs> but but like, is is this the real Mac? The Mac who got a base hit in every single game he's played, not just homered. You know, he, he he's. He's got an RBI, I think, a different way. He's got seven runs driven in. One of them was through a single. So, like, is this the real Mac? Are we finally seeing it? Like, did he hit that time? Because when a big leaguer or a ball player gets to be 26, 27 years old and they haven't made it, you kind of have to look at yourself and go, okay, I haven't made it yet. What am I doing wrong? And is it worth it for me to stick it out? And Mac decided, yes, it is. I'm going to change my swing. He worked with Justin Turner's swing doctor. I can't remember the guy's name. And completely overhauled it, so much so that Davey Martinez, the Nationals manager, after the game the other night, didn't know that Mac worked with Turner's guy and said, you know who he reminded me of? Justin Turner. So it's working. I I think there's a possibility that Mac falls into his old ways. Yes. I think that would be with you there. Right, as hitters, we we've both done it. We know what it's like to make an adjustment to your swing, you and make then all an of a sudden, and you could slide right back because he's hit a certain way right. <clears throat> for so many years in the pros. I'm not going to say since a kid. I don't know how he swung as a kid, swung as a kid, but it's certainly he's had the same swing over the last previous three or four years, and to suddenly change it, and he's having great success with it so far. 
you just you just don't know. You, you, there, inevitable slumps happen, and he's going to question it. And something someone will point it out. Hey, you, you're not doing that correction, you know, or you're not. You didn't have it changed to the way you know Justin Turner had it. And maybe he'll come back. I, I don't know. He's 27 years old. I I would bet money less than 50 percent chance that he's going to not continue three out of five. Everyone knows that. But I mean, like, okay, let's put it this way. Coming into this season, he's had a little over 200 professional at-bats in the major leagues. Okay, I'm not looking at his minor league stats right now, just his major league stats. <clears throat> right now, he's hitting 234, so it was a little lower than that before his little streak here. He's got 12 bombs and 231 at-bats. You know, that's a pretty large sample size over a three-plus year period. It's definitely not a little bit. He might be a guy who just is always going to hit 230, 240. If he is, the Mac experiment is not going to go so well. Uh, if he raises that by 30 points, 40 points to kind of 265 ballpark and can pop you 15 to 20 per you know 600 at-bats, which he seems completely capable of, no doubt about that, I, you know, he, I think he's going to stay with the Giants. But I don't know. I have my doubts, and it's not nothing against him. It's just... You've seen this happen before with other players that have been around, and then suddenly they figure it out, but then they kind of fade away. And that's what I'm wondering yeah. if, if that's going to happen. But I, I hope not. I've always been in Max Corner, obviously. Um, the one, the one I'm looking at baseball prospectus, and he was projected this year to only hit six home runs and only get 172 plate appearances, and he's going to surpass both those numbers because mm-hmm. they don't. They don't have him as a good hitter. They have him as a 232 hitter. What did he hit last year? 235? 235, yeah. 223 yeah. the year before that and 219 the year before that. Right. So, I mean, he seems to be making more contact in general and striking out less with the new swing, which leads me to believe it's possible he won't run into that wall. But, I mean, all we can do is hope because time has to pass. Yeah, time has to pass. Yeah. So we'll go with that. Um. All right, let's cover who's hot. So we haven't talked about him yet, the polarizing oh, figure that he is, apparently, in Giants fandom, which I still don't understand. Can someone out there who hates Brandon Belt explain to me the hate for Brandon Belt? I certainly, I yes, the, the only thing I've ever heard is that he's a streaky player. He'll be really hot, and then he'll be really cold. It's like, yeah, but why do you hate right. him for that? Right, like, I, Overall, his numbers aren't atrocious. Most years, they're pretty decent. He's actually, you look at, you rank him in first baseman. He's not that bad. He's certainly well above average. And yet, there's just all of this hate for him. And you just go, what other better option do they have right now? Buster Posey is not going to take over first base full time. You're not going to have Nick Hunley catching full time. This is not going to happen. Why are the fans some of them, a good portion of them, so against Brandon Bell. I I don't know. I, I don't know. I personally really like the guy. Yeah, I wish he was more consistent. But I tell you what, he's on a tear right now. And that was the number one thing I saw on Twitter. And and these these uh, Giants Facebook groups, by the way, I won't mention them by name, but... Oh, my. They're, they were not like this a couple of years ago. Uh, I've been part of these groups for, you know, four or five years. And primarily just to see what they're discussing. I rarely engage, but I certainly use it to post our links to the show and and articles and what have you. But it is just, my feed is full of just toxic banter back and forth about the Giants. People making the most absurd conclusions and ridiculous strategical opinions. And then, of course, the hate for Belt is so extreme, but... Conversely, the love for belt is there too. You have your le- your belt lovers, and right now, you have all your belt lovers coming out going, "Hey, all you belt haters, suck it! Look at him right now, five home runs in six games. You think he sucks? You really think we can replace him?" Now, number one, they have a great point, but they're they're coming at it just so aggressively. And then the belt haters come back and go, "Oh, whatever, dude. It's one week. He'll get cold again, and he'll suck. You just see, and I'll be back, and all that stuff." And you're just like. <laughs> Wow, this is. Aren't we all supposed to be fans of the same team here? <laughs> this is right. Like, why are you watching then? This is really hard to watch. But regardless of his his streakiness, 
He has hit five home runs in his last six games. He's hitting, uh, the, since we recorded last, I like to do that stat, since we last recorded, SWR, uh, since we recorded. That's what he, that means, okay. Sorry, yeah, I had that in there. Since we recorded. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love all the sorting uh, tools in baseball reference, by the way. Uh, 379 with those five home runs and eight RBI. And now for the season, he stands at 304 with six bombs and 12 RBI. His OPS is very respectable, uh, 1,040. And his war is at a cumulative 1.0. So, you know, freaking Mike Trout is leading the world in war at 2.2 right now. Um, but, hey, he's almost as half as valuable as, as Mike Trout right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's and Mike Trout's I valuable. I mean, the guy homered in three ga- straight games this weekend. And then again, yeah, the next game or the second game after that, he's up to 10 home runs now. Oh, wow. Uh, um, yeah, he hit another one. So, guys, look. Yes, Brandon Belt next week may go two for 20. I get it. And he might go back down. If a guy hits 260, 270 for the year with 20 home runs, why the hate? They have. You tell me who's going to hit better than that for them at first base. I challenge anyone. There's no answer. No one is going to hit better than that at first base. I, I just I don't understand the hate. It is frustrating when he goes through these streaks, and he had a streak in the beginning of the year where he was really, really cold and striking out with guys on base a lot. But, you know, you just got to have patience with the guy because they don't have an alternative right now. So let's support the guy, and, and he's doing really well right now, and let's see where it goes. But I, I just don't get the belt hate. Well, I mean, a lot of it has to do with approach, and I've questioned his approach before. But the last few oh, yeah, days, we I've talked been, about it a lot too. Right, we, but we I've been thinking about it by him. Why should I question his approach if it's working? Because it's working, you know. Like he was going to hit twenty-five home runs last year if he didn't have that other concussion. Mm-hmm. You know, he went through stuff last year. It wasn't just like he had a bad year. So, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to question his approach for a while. I, I, I can't. Uh, I mean, we haven't even talked about the greatest moment from the past week that Brandon Belt was part of, and he didn't even hit a home run. Oh, the man had a 20. That. I forgot to write that down. He had a 21-pitch at bat. He fouled off 11 straight pitches before putting the ball in play. Like, they didn't even get to a full count until the ninth pitch of the at bat. Yeah. And then he fouled off the next 11 straight, and then he finally flew out to right, which is fine, whatever. I didn't really care about the result. I just didn't want him to strike out. But it was a major league record. Him and this rookie pitcher, Baria, who had pitched like one other game in his whole life, this one at bat with Brandon Belt ruined the guy for the whole game. Mm-hmm. Like Belt single-handedly knocked this guy out of the game with a 21 pitch at bat and it just as it went on and on we were, we were sitting i was sitting right where i am now in my office and I, I had it on my tablet and the wife was in here with me and and like we're kind of sitting here and like about 10 pitches into it 11 pitches in i kind of like lean forward and you know we're talking i'm like wait she's like what i'm like this is like the 12th pitch of the at bat and then immediately like we both just get quiet you know <laughs> and watch it watch it out and I can only remember one other bat in my lifetime feeling that long, and that was Alex Cora and Matt Clement 15 years ago on a Sunday night. And that was like a 16-pitch at bat. So this was the modern record. And then did you see whose record he broke? Yeah, it was Alex Cora. No, no, it was Ricky Gutierrez against Bartolo Colon in Oh, I'm sorry, I was thinking of the Grand Slam that ended. That's right, it was Bartolo Colon and Ricky Gutierrez. That's right. Was that not amazing? Yeah. And Cologne's Bartolo. In 1998, Bartolo oh, no. set a record. And How much he skinnier, was, Bartolo. Yeah, he was still active to have it broken 20 years later, which is amazing. But, like, watching Belt do that, it, it tells me he can file off the pitches he wants to. And the reason he's not taking those close calls is he's done his research. Maybe the guy's not calling him there. You know, Belt's not going to extend his zone if he thinks he's going to swing and miss. What's the point? What's the difference if he swings and misses or if it's a called third strike? It's the same damn thing. It just looks worse if it's a called third strike. So I, I can't question Belt's approach anymore, especially mm-hmm. after that 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 one at bat. It, it just it showed so much about who he is. Yeah, and I guess because I didn't see it live, I saw the the, the replay of of the stitching together of all the pitches, which was really really cool. Um, yeah. But I guess at one point he actually fouled off 11 consecutive pitches. I mean, yeah. that's 
I don't even know. That sounds fake. But then until I saw the, the, the stitch together replay where you see that streak kind of all the way up until the um, until the fly out. Right. So his pitches, mm. uh, you know, night or 11 through 20 or whatever it was, or I guess 10 through 20. That's 10 through 20. Yeah. Yeah. It was all fouls. It was just click, 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 click. I was just like, this is insane. This is insane, man. And I love Brandon and, Bell at the end of the game. He was saying, you know what? I always get on, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, you know, when a guy is doing that, when he's out in the field, you hate it. And you go, come on, dude. It's not that hard to put it in play. He's also, I, I apologize to everyone for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I also heard him say he got tired at the end of it, yeah. and I don't blame him. And the other thing is, is kudos to that pitcher. Because you have to pound the zone to keep having a guy, especially a guy like Brandon Belt, keep fouling the ball off. And you can't do that against a guy like Smarja who's going to get a wild hair up his nose. You, you can only do it against a guy who's going to pound the zone. And, well, wasn't I mean, he making his major league debut? Second, second, uh, second, oh, second start, start ever. Okay, so anyway, yeah. but he's brand new to the big leagues. And yeah, he's Completely. just hanging in there with a full yep. count, throwing, you know, freaking... 11 12 strikes in a row just like the moment that know. happened i knew the giants would win that game yeah they, they should have scored like i mean the guy threw 50 pitches in the first inning the giants loaded the bases and they didn't score and they didn't score yeah right that, and that everybody was, really was like oh typical giants yada 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 but you knew they were going to break through eventually mm-hmm. because this guy it was like beach balls at that point this guy was throwing up there yeah well, over his last eight games, he has those five home runs, obviously five and six, but he had a couple hits in those other games. I just wanted to look at the forecast. Over those eight games, if you stretch it out to 162, he's hitting uh, 102 home runs and uh, 162 RBI. So there you go. Suck it, belt haters. Um, no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he's doing well. So let's hope he continues that because if it wasn't for him, the Giants probably would have lost a couple more games this week. Uh, Johnny Cueto, oh my God, this guy is just on fire. He's the best pitcher in the world right now. Um, Just crazy, man. I mean, so again, since we recorded, two starts, 13 innings pitched, no runs, only four hits in 13 innings, 18 strikeouts, and he's not like a massive strikeout guy, a a .095 batting average against and only two walks. His season now stands at a crappy 2-0 because he's had a couple no decisions despite the low ERA a 0.35 ERA that's one earned run in 26 innings pitch this year one earned run one. 23 Ks and 13 hits in those 26 innings he is just oh my god he's just going out there looking so good now clearly a 0.35 ERA is not sustainable that will not carry on um, but this has been great it's only four starts but and he was on the DL for a little bit for the blister. But, man, if it wasn't for Cueto right now, the Giants would be have another two or three losses potentially. He's, he's been outstanding. This is the Cueto that we were expecting to see, two, you know, that we saw two years ago that we thought we'd see last year when the guy had a contract you know, option coming up. It blows my mind to think that if Cueto didn't have problems last year, he might not even be a Giant at all. It's a blessing in disguise what happened because he's he's been the ace while Baumgartner's been out. I still can't get over one run in 26 innings. And, and you saw I don't know if you saw uh, after he turned the double play, I believe it was Sunday's game against the Angels, he turned the double play and he was all, you know, kicking his feet up and spun around. And it, it's Johnny Cueto's like into it this year. And, you know, I mentioned Mac earlier. Is this sustainable? I don't think this is quite sustainable for Cueto. He's going to get shelled once or two times. But I, I have a feeling this is pretty much the Johnny Cueto we should expect to see the rest of the year. Well, I mean, if he continues on this path, I mean, again, we all know he's not going to have a sub-1 ERA at the All-Star break. Um, he could have a sub-2. I think that would be incredible because guys like Chris Sale and, and uh, Scherzer and Kershaw have done that before. Kershaw's had a sub two ERA for a whole season a few years ago. Uh, if he continues on this arc, he might be the starting National League uh, pitcher again, uh, like he again. was a couple of years ago. Uh, we'll see, though. That's jumping way, way, way too far ahead. Uh, he has another uh, two months to go, two thirds of you know, twice as much as what he's pitched now. Let me put it that way. Uh, but the balloting does start in May, and uh, he might get a lot of early votes, and that might help yeah. him. If I'm not wrong, the only game that he's well, pitched... Well, I shouldn't say that. Giants... I'm sorry. He's not voted in, of course. He's chosen by the, 
the manager. Right, yeah, the manager does it. So who the hell would that be? Oh, Dave Roberts. Uh, but yeah. the thing. <laughs> Dave Roberts, that's right. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Forgot now about that. Is, that. We weren't even thinking about that because it's way too early no. for All-Star talk. But now that we're talking about it, oh, that's right. It's Dave Roberts. Nope. Um, Kershaw unless, <laughs> let me put it this way. Unless Johnny Cueto still has a 0.35 ERA, <laughs> he is not starting the All-Star game. Period. No, not there is no way if Kershaw is floating around a 2.5, a 2.2, something like that, like he normally is, there is no way he is not starting the All-Star game. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, that's it's, hilarious. It's, I completely forgot. That's a, that's a really good observation. Now, okay, yeah, but, I take that back. Yeah, well, I mean, Cueto, the only game that they've lost that he pitched was the one-hitter against Arizona. And frankly, he pitched better than Patrick Corbin, the guy who threw the one hitter that day. So there hasn't been a game yet where Cueto's pitched where it's been like, oh no, the Giants don't have a chance today. So I, it's, it's, I didn't expect him to come out like this. I really thought the contract year would be the one, but I mean, hell, well, after Stratton in line, I'll take it. And that's two consecutive games. He's gone more than five innings without allowing a hit right. to start a game. So that's that's pretty phenomenal. Um Again, not sustainable, but phenomenal. Uh, Chris Stratton, also, we mentioned him earlier. He's 2-0 and since we recorded with 13 and two-thirds innings pitched, a 1.98 ERA, 13 Ks, and a 184 batting average against. But for the season, his ERA is 2.32, and it's better than Kershaw's right now. So Cueto and Stratton have been carrying the load for starting pitching on this team because we have Samarja just coming back who's who got shelled, Ty Block, who's been very inconsistent, and, yep. uh, of course, Derek Holland, which <clears throat> you kind of just say, he's just the little boy putting his fingers in the dike right now, you know? And you're like, just try to do something out there, <laughs> you know, Derek Holland. It's, just just don't get blown up. And just as long as we're within three runs, you did okay. And that's kind of yeah. how he's been holding it right now. Yeah, because uh, you want to – he's the fifth starter. There's no question about it. Holland yeah. is the guy on the way out. He's, he's great as – you know, he's great at impressions – uh, probably a great teammate, but not not the best pitcher in the world right now. No. Um, Mac, of course, 316 since being called up with three bombs and six ribbies and hitting the proverbial shit out of the ball. Uh, he hit that one to right center, which it was the furthest ball ever hit at at t Park by a right-hander to the right of dead center field. Ever. 464 feet. So, yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's like, and you watch him get into that ball, man. He is, he is locked in. The way he kind of screws in with that back foot and kind of dips. He's got that right knee going really, really close to the ground. And he is just tattooing the ball. In fact, his first home run had the highest exit velocity and furthest distance of any ball hit by any giant this year so far. In his first game. It was, what, 114 miles per hour it left the bat? Yep. Yep, that, hardest ball hit. That's crazy. I mean, he's like, hey, guys, uh, I'm just going to come in and just hit it harder than any of you have hit it all year. Is that okay? Cool. Schmack. The guy is a man. You look at him, yeah. just his physique and, and being out there, he looks like his jaw's about 30 feet in front of him. You know, he's just like, <laughs> like hopefully he's not doing He's scary. like the slugger. He's first. All right, I'll put out two theories, not theories, but first, he's like the slugger in Major League, that's like spitting, and you know they finally blow the three fastballs by him at the end. Clue yeah. Haywood, I think, was his name. Yeah. Or, or as it was pointed out, I'm gonna give Cole Kuiper a shout out here because I don't know if he got it from the Reddit or posted it on the Reddit, but he shared it. Mac Williamson is the human creation of John Dowd, and. If you are a Major League Baseball video game player, John Dowd is the greatest video game ball player in the history of ball uh, of games, and Max Body is built just like this guy. So yeah. he's going to hit those video numbers. I, I'm not a video game player, so this had to be kind of explained to me. But like Cole shared this tweet, and I was like, you've got to be kidding me because it's like the exact same physique and everything like that. I have a buddy who jokes that he's John Dowd because he thinks he's the greatest. So like apparently it's been this running joke. So Mac Williamson is just a video game creation, so he's never going to hit that wall, apparently. He's actually going to keep hitting three home runs every five days. <laughs> yeah, I saw that um, I saw that uh, 
that tweet from Cole, and I forgot to look it up. I I swear to God, and I'm looking it up right now just because I want I don't want to be crazy. I don't know what year it was from. Ah, that's it. I was right. I was right. So I I've always been big into video games, and um, I I've been playing a lot of you know RBI, not RBI, but. Uh, uh, MVP baseball back in the day and uh, the show, which is the only real baseball game out now. That's right. I knew it was in the mid 2000s and I just wanted to confirm it. So Barry Bonds at one point broke from MLB licensing uh, back in the middle of his heyday and or after he set the, you know, the record and all that stuff like that. So him and his agent thought it would be better to basically excise him from MLB property and he was successful in doing that so he licensed his own products his own gear and all that and as a result any uh, uh, you know company that licensed video games through MLB now could not have Barry Bonds in their video game so what they did is they replaced him with John Dowd in the game <laughs> that's now, what it was I yeah. don't know where he got they got the name John Dowd but um, I do remember uh, that happening and, and playing it. So anyway, I just I just had to quickly look it up. And, and yeah, I like, absolutely. I mean, I needed to know the real thing. reason. So yeah, so he was the right-handed white version of uh, of Barry Bonds. <laughs> yes. Now Back I get why. That Isn't that funny? Yeah, that is funny because I, I knew about like the MLBPA type stuff, but I didn't realize I had gone that far. I, well, I stopped what's playing. What's really funny about it is I saw his tweet. And I saw the graphic, and I was like, I don't even remember what number he was. But uh, is Mac number 51? What number is he wearing? I, what is he wearing this year? That's a, I think he's wearing 51. Yeah, so I think that was the real connection. Um, because I didn't know if that was Photoshopped or not, but now I'm looking up all the images. And indeed, John Dowd was a white, very tall, right-handed player, number, wore number 51 right here. That's hilarious. Yeah, there it is. He's 51 again this year. Okay. So You think we noticed that because we've seen his back swing. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. I, I, I loved that. I, 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 had, I had to give a little nod to Cole on that. I, I don't know if you found it from the Reddit. I'm on the Reddit, subreddit all the time, too. Yeah. But it was just really, really funny. That is really, really cool. Good observation there. Plus, um, I like to give credit because uh, he, he, he seems to uh, promote good things when they come across. Like, he's shared our stuff before. So uh, Hunter Strickland, you know, he's gotten a little bit of hate again this year too. But I think, yeah, he's blown two games. Uh, but sorry, sorry, two saves. But the Giants won both of them. So his blown saves haven't hurt the team per se. Uh, his ERA is like a one point six two right now. He's got good stuff. He's just run into a, you know two bad swings really, and both of them involved Paul Goldschmidt. <laughs> so you know it's like all right. So don't have him don't have him save against Paul Goldschmidt. I guess. That that would be the answer. Uh, so he's converted three saves in a row, and I think he's doing a fine job. He's he's not he's not terrible right now. Uh, no. Two saves ago, he did have you know his runners on the corners, and um, Mike Trout was looming on deck, and he got the batter to to pop out or whatever it was or strike out. But you know it it is what it is. Again, what is the better alternative right now? Moranta's making a good case. Uh, but aside from him, I don't see anyone else who would be the logical replacement for him. And again, you don't replace a guy who's blown two one-run leads off the right. same guy in which games you actually ended up winning anyway. So the Giants' record has not been affected in a negative way because of Hunter Strickland. Now, I'm impressed with Hunter this year. Um, a lot of it has to do with Posey. And Strickland's willingness to go off the fastball. Uh, the other night, it was Monday night's game. Strickland did not have it. He he clearly he just didn't have it. His fast. Mm -hmm. I think he was amped up because it was the Nats. Because his fastball kept drifting high and away. And we all know that your release point gets screwed up when you get a little too excited. And Buster just kept going to the breaking stuff and 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 starting off pitches, you know, batters with breaking stuff and kind of pitching backwards. And doing those things, and I think it helps Strickland. And frankly, he seems like a different guy. He seems more mature. He doesn't seem like the same buckethead that threw at Strickland last year and ended Morse's career. You know, after working oh. with Smoltz in the off season, and I believe, if I'm not wrong, I think Strickland got married recently too. 
And as weird as it sounds, that always kind of seems to help. Mm-hmm. Guys always seem to get a little more grounded when they get married. They uh, they just seem to be a little more mature. They they seem to handle their stuff better, if you will. So I've had no problem with Strickland. He's he is hot. He in my in my mind. I don't. I wouldn't say he's not hot. Yeah, he's still hot. Oh, there it is. I had to scroll up. Uh, he mm-hmm. he should be the closer. We talked about it, and you'll mention him on the uh, update. But uh, there's no reason for now that Strickland should be anywhere but where he is. Yeah, I thought Hunter had been married. I think it was a kid he had, and so I just looked it up, and it was just oh, yeah, his, okay. his daughter was born last April, actually. So his daughter's a year. Oh wow! Old. Yeah. Oh, wow. But I will agree with you in that um, having a kid can definitely, you know, change you for the better. But ironically, that fight happened after. Yeah, because well, it was Memorial after. Day. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but to be after. fair, <laughs> to be fair, he wasn't home all off season with you know a newborn or anything like that. Yeah. So he he totally didn't know what he was in for yet. And I have a feeling that somehow, some way, he kind of got humbled this off season. Right. So uh, I mean, some of the bullpen has been holding it down, but I'm not going to list you know eight people as far as being who's hot. We can talk about who's not. Jeff Samarja. He came up for his first game against the Angels, and here I'm thinking, oh, my God, we just talked about him getting lit up in San Jose, you know, grand, allowing a grand slam to a guy who had two home runs and 700-something career at bats. Yeah, that still leagues. blows me away. And so I was like, oh, he is going – I mean, we're talking Mike Trout and all these guys. He is just going to get – nope, zero runs over five innings. It was like, huh? What? What happened there? So then there was that little brief, you know, illumination of hope. But much like he's been with the Giants – he is hot or cold. He's a little bit like Brandon Belt on the mound. He can have a great game and then just get blown the F up, and that's exactly what happened against the Nets. He just got torched, man. Just torched. It was the same old um, shark bombs, you know, and, and getting, yeah. getting hit. So, unfortunately, he got trashed yesterday and is, is over two games. Granted, it's small, whatever. His ERA is going to fluctuate, but it's a 6.23. Which included the five shutout innings, which is why it's so bad. So obviously he's been cold. Brandon Crawford, he started out the season pretty well. He is now two for his last 28. That's been since we recorded. No RBI, one run, nine Ks, and a season average is now down to 200. So he's, uh, granted, we all love him for his defense more than his offense, but he's still an okay hitting shortstop with a little bit of pop, and he's just not been showing it right now. So, he I mean, looks lost at the plate. Concern. He he looks completely lost. But here's the thing, and and you know there I didn't list him in my who's not right now. Um, but Andrew McCutcheon, he's getting up to 88 at bats now. He's hitting 205, and I think yeah. a lot of the pressure has been off of him because of a couple of big home runs he's had, uh, or uh, and, and big hits. He's he's had two walk offs by himself. I mean the Giants only have 11 wins, right? Two of them are via Andrew McCutcheon. So he he's definitely been valuable to the team, but overall, 205, at hitting at the top of the lineup, this is not good. This is just not good at all. His on-base percentage is 314. Um, oh. Yeah. This is <laughs> I mean, this I knew he was good. struggling, and I looked at some numbers the other day, but... His OPS Oof. is 666. There you go. Woo-hoo. Oh, wow. I, I have a buddy... OPS. I have a buddy who's a Pirates fan, and he hasn't been happy with Kutch for like two or three years now. Well, last year and this, he was incredible with the Pirates. I thought so too. The Pirates. I thought so too. But yeah. like my buddy seems to like totally jump ship. And this is a guy who like understands baseball. He's not like just some, you know what I mean. And he 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 thinks that Kutch has lost it. And I'm starting to wonder because. Like, when he makes contact, he's hitting the ball hard, but he's not making as much contact as I expected him to make. That's kind yeah. of what's been the surprise. Yeah, so, um, man, Kutch has got to really turn it on here. He's almost 100 bats into the season. He's only got 18 hits and 88 eight bats. That's that's not good. Uh, Crawford, Jeez. like I said, is, is lower than him, and Hunter Pence, of course, is hitting 172, kind of rounding out the guys who have had significant at-bats this year because you don't include – any of the pitchers. Well, in fact, there's no other players below him anyway, so that doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, Andrew Jackson is. Did I say Andrew? <laughs> Austin Jackson. He's not a president. Uh, two thirteen. So not not so good there. Two fifty eight odd base percentage for a 
leadoff hitter. Not good. Yeah. Well, I don't. He's not a leadoff hitter anymore. Yeah. Uh, I think I think the lineup it wasn't it was Tuesday's lineup I believe that went panic and this is this funny this is actually my armchair manager but Jackson's been dropped down to seventh or eighth and I think he's going to spend some time down there with Crawford I don't think that Bochi likes him as a leadoff man because no. the guy never gets on base he doesn't get on base I mean that's that's the number one rule right your leadoff guy's got to right. get on base or at least have a higher on base percentage than most of the other guys. Evan Longoria has had a nice little uh, three-game streak, which he had a couple of bombs and everything, but he's just gone ice cold the last three games again. So overall, he's 222 on the year. Um, yeah, he's, what, four? After that little three-game mini streak the uh, beginning of last yeah. week, he's four for 23. So, so My concern. Just, well, he's Longoria, it's weird because Longo was like, I can't wait to get on the road trip because then we can bond as a team. And then he comes home and he struggles again. Like I know. he seems to be a guy having a tough time adjusting to AT and T Park. I think seeing balls get hit 350 feet and dying in the air is getting to him a little bit. Yeah, because that's, that's there's something at home. He's just not clicking just yet. Which is, I mean, I don't want to say fine. The guy's got seven doubles on the season. That's impressive. He leads the team by four. Like nobody even has more than three. So that's you know, yeah. he's consistent in the sense that he'll hit for extra bases and power but he's just not hitting enough at all right now you know i wonder what that is i wonder why he's having a hard time at home yeah he's and at hopefully 67 at home and 255 on the road yeah that's a that's that's almost 100 points yeah. i don't know what it is i'm still happy with longo as the third baseman though i'm fine with it i'd rather have him than pablo 10 yeah, out of no, 10 i'm days still fine with him and, and obviously cutch in, in right field i'm not yeah yeah. Not uh, poo pooing that. I just, you know, your two. They're just not hot. <laughs> your two main jewels that you acquired over the over the season, just have not been, you know, pulling what was expected of them so far. Plenty of time to turn it around. Plenty of time, you know. But I, I, I fully expect Longo and Kutch to all end up above 250, with you know, 20 bombs. And if that's what <laughs> they do, that's kind of what my expectations were at. Uh, but if they end the season at 220, 230. You know, with less than 20 bombs, then I'd say that it was a fairly large failure on the part of both of those guys. Because strangely, Kutch, Kutch is only on on the team for a year, and unless right he does something great and the Giants want to keep him, I think this is the only time he's ever going to play for the Giants. I think next year he's with another team. Yeah, it was weird because I thought that particular reason would be why Kutch would do better than Longo, but I have more faith now that Longo is going to be a better hitter down the stretch than McCutcheon. But that's just April, and we're making judgments off of three weeks of baseball. So. Yeah, again, we're talking yeah, 20, right. 24 games, guys. Okay, yeah. so armchair – or no, injury update. Let's do that first. So Mark Melanson, he was kind of off for two weeks after he got that stem cell injection we talked about, and he was supposed to return to, quote, baseball activities today, which meant light throwing and other things. I have not seen anything – come across Twitter recently to, to, to report out what he might have been doing today. But if you assume that he's getting back and, and throwing on flat ground today, um, that's great. I did hear an interview with Bochi last week, and they kind of asked him about, hey, how, what do you expect? And it really is an I don't know situation. They don't know. They were going to wait till he got back into baseball activities and judge it from there. And, I mean, the good news is that there was no structural damage. They've proven that. There's just this irritation he can't seem to overcome, which was you know, a bit of the stem cell injection. Um, but w I don't want to beat a dead horse. We really went into it last time. And, uh, you know, he's, he's definitely fleeced the Giants so far. And the guy <laughs> seems to be just the, the opposite of Midas right now. You know, he yeah. just... Man, no, he third just, square... Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say they're at square. They're at square one for five him. years, you know, and then he joins the Giants, and it's like a curse was placed upon him and the team. That's the way it goes. Um, so yeah, no, no timetable on him. And then Chris Stratton, we just talked about him. He is on the paternity list for his second child, and Roberto Gomez was called up. So uh, Strat had the kid. Yeah, and we'll be back to pitch Saturday against LA. Okay, and I, I heard something like that, but I wasn't sure, so that's great that you reported that out. So um, the good news is is that they kind of have an extra reliever for Friday night, I guess, right? Because yeah. um, assuming he's not put back on the roster then. So no, there's no there's no need to put him back on until Saturday, and they get 26 yep. guys on Saturday. So There you go. 
That's right. So that's cool. Um, let's get a little of armchair manager. We don't always cover this, but uh, I thought it was an interesting develop this week. <laughs> Bruce Bochy joined Twitter. So my question is, should Bochy have joined Twitter? <laughs> uh, I, I'm willing to bet because uh, I, I, he quote unquote joined Twitter yesterday or two days ago whenever he did some Twitter chat. But um, somebody did a little digging and found that he actually joined on the final day of last season. He oh. just never t- tweeted anything. And my oh. assumption means he and Flan were sitting around drinking some wine. The season was over. Maybe something else was ingested. And I'm sure that Flan was like, you should see these people. And Boshi's like, well, I'm going to sign up. Let's see what it is. And then they're both like, no, no, don't tweet. Don't tweet. That wouldn't be a good idea. (laughs) And then they waited until he did this Twitter chat the other day and had, like, the Giants people set it up or something like that. Should he have joined? No, he shouldn't have because people are going to tag him and say the stupidest things. Yeah, I read uh, an article with him from yesterday, and they were asking about that. And they said, so are you prepared? First of all, he had like 14,000 followers in the first 24 hours. And he's like, is that a lot? And I guess like Hank Truman <laughs> is like, I have 65,000 over nine years. So, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot, dude. Um, and they asked him, you know, are you prepared for the negativity? How are you going to use Twitter? It can be toxic and all that. And, um, oh, I don't have the article up right now. But uh, he said something to, something to the effect of, well, basically, I, I'm really primarily going to use Twitter for things like charities, uh, announce charities and, and those kinds of events. So he's not going to necessarily use it for, hey, guys, this is why I did this move. I mean, so far he's tweeted out like, hi, guys, I'm on Twitter. I'm right. or something like that. And then, well, hey, guys, we're undefeated since I joined Twitter. We're 1-0, and oh, right? Yeah, well, that, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. And so, and, and, you know, I looked at the responses, and, of course, there's a lot of positive ones. And then there's some really, really bad ones, too, some really negative ones. Uh, and they asked him about the negative ones. He's like, well, if I read them, maybe I'll just tweet something back like, you know, uh, have a great day or something like that. <laughs> uh, Boat, like, you're no, not going to want to waste your time. He's like, Flan warned me. He's like, yeah, I probably won't read all that stuff. So and I was like, well, of course not. Of course, you're, you're the manager of, of a Major League Baseball team with a Twitter account. You do not read any of the tweets. None. You could log no. on and go, hey, guys. Hope you had a nice day and log off. But that's about it. <laughs> Announce your charities, well, right? That's you did the same thing we all do. Nobody knows what to say for their first tweet. Nobody's not, uh, you know, I remember when I signed up for Twitter, you know, I didn't know anybody. I wasn't a part of any of these communities. I, I'm like, what, what, what do I do? And he kind of did the same. And I'm looking, he's got two more tweets now. He's talking about come hang with me and Amy G. And then mm-hmm. he'll be with Marty uh, after the game yesterday. Um, so he retweeted that Marty said that, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's so. it. <laughs> so that's really, should he have joined? no, he shouldn't have joined. No, he shouldn't. Have. He shouldn't have joined. He shouldn't have joined, but he did. So hopefully he's not reading anything. He's just opening up the, the compose window and hitting send and then closing it. <laughs> and I've tried it. to do that before when I'm watching a game or something. And I know I'm on a slight lag, so I don't want to get it spoiled. I'll try to, it's so hard to do. It's well, so hard to open Twitter yeah. and not read the timeline. It's so well, hard. Well, the fact that he retweeted Marty's tweet, you know, it's like, well, I mean, it could he could have just looked at mentions, but a lot of people are sending oh, him mentions. So yeah. I'm sure he's read a couple of things and went, whoa, that's that's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't be but shocked, he, though, if his guy or Marty said to him, hey, I, I, I tagged you now that I can. And he's like, yeah. oh, really? Let me try this. Yeah, Bochi's the kind of guy where it doesn't, to be honest, if he read every single tweet ever made in a disparaging way against him, he'd just be like, eh, whatever. Like, yeah, he, he wouldn't care. He's ser- it would roll off his back. Unlike a Tim Flannery, who just, yeah. whoo, man, he does not like people attacking him or baseball or anything like that. He will fight like a dog. So, and he'll... I like Tim Flannery, but man, he's made himself look like an ass several times <laughs> with his responses. Because number one, the guy needs some grammar and spelling, uh, you know, <laughs> education. But he doesn't or, care because he's a he's just lazy. Writer. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know he, he knows how to spell these words, but the way it's written, it's like, are you twelve? But um, uh-huh. yeah, and then he'll just go off about saber met 
sabermetricians and 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 politics and and things like that where it's like all right pump the brakes dude you're, you're it's okay. but he's got time on his hands i he's i, got I time. love uh, i've yeah, gone back and forth with flan plenty i uh, there's it's hard for flan to ever do something wrong in my eyes it's just that's just me though that's total personal uh personal stuff with flan i'll go to yeah, my he arm seems like he'd be a fun guy to go have a, a beer or something oh else yeah with. The, the, right. the the time i've spent with him we didn't even talk baseball so it's it's Oh, that's right. I forgot kind of, about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's nice. You know, he's that kind of guy. You know, I I know some of his family. It's you know, it's just it's how it is. It's kind of it's Twitter did that. You know, that's kind of what I mean when I say you know, Bochi gets on like we all did, and we all like I don't know what to say. You know, but that was God. I've been on Twitter nine years. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's like wow, all this stuff comes from it. So, but Bochi, no. Because if 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 you know what, I should tag Bochi. I can give him my armchair manager. I should tell him I want to see more of the lineup he trotted out <laughs> on Tuesday. I loved having Panic Bat first. I loved Cutch second, Belt third, Posey. I mean, you immediately go left, right, left, right. Yeah. And then you have Longo and Mac as the thump for all those guys who get on base. So, I, like, I should tweet at him. And t- no, I'll never do that. But, like, that's my armchair manager. Give me more of that lineup. That's that's the lineup I want to see. And then, I guess, Jackson batting uh, and Crawford batting seventh and eighth. Seventh and eighth, because, yeah. Right. I, know, I like I mean, that, too. I, I like that, too. Um, belt on the third hole, especially the way he's hitting right now. Yeah. Posey's always been hitting fourth. Uh, Longo, Mac, yeah. And we'll see how long Kutch lasts with this bad streak, but. Um, I like that lineup, too. All right, so coming up, the Giants have four versus the Dodgers at home. Of course, they have a doubleheader on Saturday. That's for the makeup of a rainout earlier this month, um, which will be fun. Uh, four versus the Dodgers. They're holding their, their own against L.A. They're only half game back of L.A. right now. So let's, you know, obviously split is an absolute minimal requirement. You cannot lose three out of four at home to L.A., that's just going to start that slow burying process once again, like three out of four versus San Diego. But, hey, you know, we can always hope for three out of four the Giants win. If they do that, they're going to gain two games on L.A., hopefully gain a game on Arizona, and be back up to, uh, well, that would put them a game above 500 at the end of the series. Yeah. So I think that's, that's, that's the real goal is three out of four. That's hard, though. It's hard. The way they're built right now and against the Dodgers, who are a really good team, you know, what are you well, going to do? I mean, I'll uh, say they're lined up really well for the weekend. Yeah, because they've got there, right? str- they well they got Stratton and Cueto going on Saturday. See, I'm not even there yet. They've got Stratton and Cueto pitching the doubleheader, and those are the Giants' two best pitchers. Yeah. You know, they could they could look to to sweep because Holland's throwing the Friday game and Block will start on Sunday against Maeda. But Cueto and Stratton on the doubleheader is huge, and then. The one name I didn't mention there was Clayton Kershaw will not be pitching in this series. Mm-hmm. The Giants get to miss him after all the times that they see him extra time this, extra time that. Like This was an extra long series, too, because of the rain out, and the Giants still managed to miss Kershaw. It, it's kind of a blessing. Yeah, I, I, it's fantastic. Uh, the Giants have beaten Kershaw, and Kershaw has not been the Kershaw of old so far at the beginning of the season, but he hasn't been absolutely atrocious. He's just hit a couple bumps here in the road here. Derek Holland, though, the only thing that concerns me is with that goal of, of three out of four, him pitching game number one, anything can happen. But, you know, yeah. the Giants offense goes to sleep and he allows his normal three or four runs in five innings or six innings eh, and they lose game one. Then you're you're suddenly up against the, oh, my God, we need to win two out of three just a split. And that's where I think the problem comes in. So. You know, I'm not saying they should change the you know rotation or anything like that, uh, but Derek Holland leading off is is just, it's rough. It's rough, and teams rarely sweep double headers. It's amazing the percentages are so. You'd think that, and I don't have the stats in front of me, but I know it's far less than 25. percent But let's say you have you know two dice, right, and you roll them against one another two times in a row. Well, 25 percent of the time. Uh, you're going to have one team beat the other and the other beat the other. So if you add those two up because you flip-flop games, it's 50% 50 of the time you're going to have a split, and then 25% of the time you're going to have one team sweep and 25% of the time the other team sweeps. Well, it's definitely not that 50% 
total in terms of either team sweeping. So it's uh, it's far, far, far less than that. It seems that, that splits are just way more common than statistically expected. I don't know why that is. Uh, yeah, I think that I would be either. a whole paper in itself. Point I'm making is most likely the Giants would split on Saturday. And if they lose Friday's game, that puts a lot of pressure on Sunday. I'm getting way ahead of myself. I just think it's it's going to be hard with Holland and the, and the doubleheader. But yeah. but that's why I like the way they're Strat- lined up with Strat and Quato. Strat- I was going right. to say, but Strat and Quato, I think, give them a better chance of potentially winning both games than otherwise. So, yeah. you know, as, as as far as those doubleheaders, I have to wonder, and this is just for the study. We'll we'll talk about this on the doubleheader podcast. Um, I have to wonder if the team that won the first game if there's some sort of psychological letdown in the yeah. second game, because they've already won a game that day and your body, your mind is like, all right, I already won. So who the hell cares if I win this game? You know, you don't really feel that way, but like there might be something in the back of the mind there. I don't yeah, know. We'll tackle totally that right. on the, you know, so I, I wonder just maybe as you're talking, I thought of that. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Uh, and then after that, they have three against San Diego at home. So those are the next seven games we do anticipate on recording on monday so most likely it would only be after these four games but it's a worthy one to talk about because it is against the dodgers so we can try and get back on our our normal schedule if things fall apart for whatever reason then it it, it might be the thursday or the following monday but um, like we said we want to get back on this regular pattern of, of of recording every week if we can so it's okay to record after the four game series some people do this every day yeah yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. I don't know how they yeah, find time, but days. yeah. All right. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say, and, and Eric mentioned it at the top of the show, but he's been writing a lot more for the site. Uh, I love his uh, weekly torture reports right now. They're very well written, and they're a lot of fun, so I urge you guys to uh, check those out. Uh, they come out generally every Friday. I know this last week you did it on Monday because of the uh, the reason that we didn't you know, record the podcast, but please yeah. check those out. They're fantastic. You can subscribe to us on iTunes, on Stitcher. You can even find us on Podomatic and Podbean. And, Spotify. Uh, get us on Spotify. And now we automatically publish to YouTube as well. It's no, There's no video, obviously. <laughs> I mean, if in a perfect world, I'd love to live stream this and have video. And we have the technical capabilities to do all of that. But I have to honestly ask myself, is that really going to enhance the podcast and, and, and your enjoyment? I think... <laughs> First of all, you don't want to see our ugly mugs. Uh, nope. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Second of all, then I have to, like, not look like as much crap as I do right now. Oh, I yeah. To, I've, I've been in the yard all day, so I look I'd have like to get a lit crap. background and, and do all this, like, professional-looking stuff. And I just, you know what? Probably not going to happen. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know. We might play with it. I've shaved in a while. Point. But yeah, it's not it's not like, oh my gosh, we're getting so many more followers because they could see us now. In fact, I think our followers would drop after <laughs> the YouTube's good though. I I'll, I'll tell folks though, that's a good place to listen to the podcast, although yeah. this is the end of the show and you've heard it late, you know, on the other. But I've done it myself because it's easy to just pop it on. Or if you have like an Alexa, you can say, Alexa, play the most recent torture cast podcast and she'll yeah. start doing it. And she does it on YouTube, yeah. She looks over there. So um I haven't had that work on Spotify yet. I can play it on Spotify, and I have Spotify registered with my Alexa, so she'll play, you know, music that I asked for. Now playing, you know, Bob Dylan on Spotify. But when I say TortureCast, she says I can't find TortureCast. Yeah, I don't know why she didn't just play it just then. She's sitting right next to me. I expected to have to mute real quick, and she never started talking. Something must be wrong with my Alexa. Oh well, that's all right. So um, check that out at. Uh, torturecast.com you can find all of the links to the show notes to the podcast to Eric's articles to the other stuff we've written interviews uh, in the past and hopefully you'll be able to go to a game here soon and get some more interviews going on you can follow us collectively at torturecast like us on Facebook or follow us individually at chatk21 you can follow Eric at two out hits with the number two and then Ben and Willie they've obviously taking a um a, ba- a step back in terms of the podcast and they're not they're not officially out or anything like that everyone so if you if you're a fan of, of Willie or, or Ben they will appear sporadically but not often to be honest so they they have other things in their uh, their hobbies and careers that have developed that don't allow them to record as often as as they would like to and we would like them to but 
they're still certainly welcome back on the show and and willie's probably going to make more appearances than ben but uh follow along for that you can follow them individually at willie dills and at fried duck so have anything else there eric that i missed no it's hard torture report like you said it'll come out I'll probably hold off till next Friday for another one because, sure. you know, we talked here, we talked Dodgers here. Uh, unless I get the urge to write in the middle of the night, and I doubt that's going to happen. So there'll probably be there probably won't be anything until next week. So I'll be able to promo it again next week. Awesome. Okay. Well, for Eric, this is Chad signing off for episode 140, and we'll see you next week, probably Monday, for episode 141. Boom. A big thank you to everybody for listening to the Torture Cast, the podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants. Follow us on Twitter at TortureCast. You can also like us on Facebook or check out our blog at TortureCast.com. I also want to say thank you to Ashcon and Bailey for letting us use their song Feeling Like a Giant for our intro. For Ben Lee and Chad King, my name is Willie Dills saying we'll see you next time. <laughs>